The warnings are getting more dire by the day. Just last week, the U.N. chief warned that humanity has opened the gates of hell with a lack of action on climate change. But just how much are governments willing to pay to fight global warming and who should foot the bill? Resolving this is most critical for our region. And this has been a stark message from the Asian Development Bank. The battle against climate change will be won or lost in the Asia Pacific. And the reason is simple. It's where nearly half of climate-related disasters have happened since the start of the century, with increasing frequency and intensity. Affecting more than three and a half billion people it will be a costly battle. The ADB estimates $1.7 trillion is needed every year to invest in infrastructure. It recently launched a new funding program to support lending efforts. Known as IFCAP, which stands for Innovative Finance Facility for Climate in Asia and the Pacific, wealthier nations such as the US, UK, Japan and South Korea will guarantee some loans and shoulder losses in cases of default. The initial target is $3 billion in guarantees. It believes this will help to generate five times as much in new climate loans under the $1 in $5 out model. All right, for more, joining us now is Warren Evans. He's the Special Senior Advisor for Climate Change at the Asian Development Bank. Warren, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Firstly, let's uh, delve into the details of IFCAP. A very interesting model, $1 in, $5 out. How does this model work, and what are the anticipated impacts for the DMCs? The, the IFCAP works by taking guarantees from donor countries and using that to essentially carve out part of our existing sovereign portfolio. So these are loans, existing loans that uh, developing countries have taken with the ADB that have sovereign guarantees. We have a very, very low risk of default for those kinds of loans. So by using the guarantees to carve out part of our existing portfolio, we're able to mobilize about five times as much uh, as we actually take off. So for every dollar guarantee, $5 in, in new climate finance. Yeah, it's hard for governments to budget for what insurers would call acts of God or these extreme weather events that we're seeing. Are you seeing countries start to build or set aside contingency funds? I suppose this IFCAP is sort of, it's that in practice, isn't it? Well, it, it, IFCAP will actually finance both adaptation and mitigation measures that are, are not responding to the disasters that we've seen over the last couple of years. Those fu the funding for events such as the flooding in Pakistan that was so devastating last year, uh, that has to come from other sources. That has to be concessional finance, and we are short on that kind of funding. Uh, we do have in ADB and other multilateral development banks typically have donor funding for responding to those disasters, but we're way underfunded in those areas. Governments are very stretched. Developing country governments are very stretched, partly because of the pandemic. So the idea that they can set aside funding to respond to these disasters is probably wishful thinking right now. Mm -hmm. So we really need to get much more innovative in how we are able to help them overcome the climate disasters that they are facing right now. I understand that given that some countries still remain hesitant when it comes to net zero uh, transitions um, and also systemic changes due to economic risk, how is ADB um, reassuring them or engaging these countries or industries? Well, there, I, I think we need to categorize the countries in two uh, classes. One, most of our developing member countries contributed virtually nothing to the climate problem. They are low emitters uh, per capita and national, but they're feeling the impacts of that. So helping them to move towards net zero is not about their commitment to low carbon, but rather energy security, better air quality in their cities and so on. There are other countries, uh, such as Indonesia, where we're working with them to actually help decarbonize. So we have a, an initiative called, initiative called the Energy Transition Mechanism, which is bringing concessional and, and cap, other capital to the table to essentially help uh, close the, some of the coal-fired power plants early uh, by several years, in fact. So how are you sort of seeing this uh, play out then in practice? We saw recently President Biden welcomed uh, countries from the Indo-Pacific, uh, the Pacific Islands in particular. Climate change is a big thing on their agenda. Uh, the U.S. is one of the biggest contributors to, uh, to climate you know, impacts with it, in, through emissions. Is the U.S. Uh, going to put its money where its mouth is when it comes to this sort of thing? 
The, well, I hope so. Uh, we haven't seen it yet. And I think that this is a struggle that we have to continue as a global community. We have to continue pushing the richer countries to come forward with not just loans, but, but grants to help the countries such as uh, Marshall Islands and, and particularly the atoll states that are so vulnerable to climate impacts uh, to help them to overcome those impacts. And the concept of just transition seems to be gaining um, uh, prominence. How is ADB ensuring that climate and energy transition is happening in a just and fair way? Well, first off, we are putting it front and center of everything that we do on climate. Uh, the, we're learning as we go. This is, this is a new challenge for us. But for example, in the energy transition mechanism, which could end up being the largest decarbonization initiative the world's seen to date, that has built into it just transition. So those who are affected by laborers that work in coal-fired power plants that lose their jobs, what do we do to help them get trained and get other jobs? And, and there's a, a big community around that industry. How do we help those communities to actually be economically viable uh, and, and actually contribute to the development of the country? So it's a matter of planning and financing. And we're building both of those into everything we do now. The task seems almost insurmountable. I mean, coordinating various different nations to sort of pull together towards, you know, a common a goal and making people or countries that can afford it to play their part as well. Uh, where do you get your optimism from for, for seeing that things are moving in the right direction when it comes to funding for mitigation and adaptation for countries that are responsible for so much of the emissions actually playing their part in helping countries that aren't responsible but are bearing the brunt? My optimism is not based on what governments are doing, but more on what the private sector is doing. Mm. The, the trillions of dollars required are not going to come from just governments. That has to be private sector capital. The, the interest of the private sector in working with us and with other, other multilateral development banks to use the sovereign funding that we have, the public sector money that we have, to help enable them to invest in climate actions is actually making tremendous progress right now. That's where my optimism lies. Speaking of optimism, ADB is increasingly referred to as a climate bank now. Could you share with us some success stories or in a cases where uh, climate financing had an impact on uh, the country's um, climate resilience or mitigation? Well, the, it's, it's work in progress. Uh, but we've had many success stories in the urban sector, for example, where we have used uh, nature-based solutions to help increase resilience to flooding. So rehabilitating re uh, wetlands, for example, in, in urban areas, um, cooling efforts in, in cities that have uh, very, very bad heat conditions now are, are yielding results in terms of improved labor conditions, improved uh, urban conditions for, for those who are most exposed, most vulnerable, which are generally women and children. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have both in the urban sector and in the rural sector a number of initiatives that are, that are paying back dividends now in terms of building resilience. On the low carbon side, we have a, a very large portfolio of renewable energy, uh, wind, solar, working on battery now, battery storage. So uh, many success stories, but we're not at the scale we need to be. We need to bring this all together and actually scale it up. So we just approved a new action plan in ADB to actually move us into the next orbit on climate action. And just to end, uh, for our viewers watching at home, what's the one thing you'd like them to take away from, from IFCAP and what the Asian Development Bank is doing? Well, I, I, I think that for the countries where we work, the developing countries where we work, it's important to recognize that the risks that they face in, from climate impacts are severe. Every greenhouse gas emission reduced, every ton of GHG emission reduced is very important. And people, every household can play a role in that. So particularly not so much in the poorer countries, but in the, the better off countries, the middle income countries, and in the richer countries, every household needs to play a role in reducing their carbon footprint. All right, Warren, appreciate your time and your insights this morning. Thank you so much for coming in today. We're speaking to Warren Evans, a special senior advisor for climate change at the Asian Development Bank.